Our next session is a fireside chat on the topic data-driven manufacturing, building a connected value chain. This session will discuss key trends, practices, and challenges towards building a connected value chain and data excellence in manufacturing. Our speaker this afternoon is Ken Klein Hampel, Vice President, Engineering, Product Delivery, Whirlpool Corporation. Ken joined Whirlpool Corporation in 2009. He's accountable for product delivery excellence. His overall vision and strategy development is to redefine the industry standard for product delivery excellence and delivering a differentiated consumer experience. Moderating this session is Jay Simha Chalisani, Vice President and Global Head for the Discrete and Process Manufacturing Businesses, Tech Mahindra Integrated Engineering Solutions. Jay has more than 25 years of experience in driving global engineering services for Fortune 1000 customers, covering digital IoT industry 4.0 adoption, new product development, cost innovation, while driving productivity and quality improvements. Recently, Jay has been involved in a massive supply chain transformation program for an industrial major, where nearshoring of more than a billion dollars of supplier spent is enabled from China to other geographies of the world. Pleasure to have you both join us uh, here this afternoon. Over to you, Jay. Thank you, Justin. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome you all for this session uh, in on the NASCOM Design and Engineering Summit. I am Jay Simha Chalsani, Jaya. Global Head of Discrete and Process Manufacturing Business uh, in Engineering Services for Tech Mahindra. And today uh, we have with us uh, you know, Mr. Ken Klemhampel, the Vice President and Global uh, Head of the Product Organization and drives the product development excellence at Whirlpool. And uh, we both are going to discuss uh, uh, a specific topic uh, you know, uh, in our five set chart, which is uh, all about the uh, use of uh, data and analytics in uh, you know, the manufacturing. So, and, uh, you know, building a connected value chain uh, in the process. So, Ken, welcome to the summit. It's a pleasure having you today. Thank you, JR. Looking forward to it. Ken, uh, you had a very long and, uh, you know, uh, illustrious career, looking after quality and multiple aspects and uh, more uh, probably last decade into consumer appliances industry. So, you want to give a little bit brief about yourself and your journey? Okay, great. Um, so, my, my career started off um, where I was in a developmental program and I was working for a company called ITT and uh, building military uh, equipment, night vision equipment. And I was in a, uh, an up or out program, a developmental program that gave uh, essentially background into different aspects of the business, commercial operations, um, strategy, those types of things. And I wound up falling in love with, you know, the operational aspects of the, the business. And so, I spent about 10 years with ITT and, and had a really good career. And then I wanted to learn about Six Sigma. And I, I heard a lot about Motorola and what was going on with Six Sigma. And so I, I took a job at, at Motorola. And my roles at, at Motorola were you know running engineering organizations and um, plants, and then ultimately setting up plants in, in many parts of the world and uh, actually building some of the first plants um, over in, in Asia and to, into China and putting engineering groups in place. And so my role has always been um, a transformational role, trying to understand um, what are the current situations that are going around the world and how can we do things better and faster with a higher level of quality. And what Motorola taught me was uh, zero defects and measuring things in, in parts per billion was a, a different way of of thinking about things and understanding from an engineering perspective, literally we'd use a phrase down to the atomic level to understand very precisely what's going on with every aspect of, of what you're doing. And then moving over here to Whirlpool Corporation, leading quality here also as, as I did at Motorola and then getting into consumer services. And now I'm, I'm back in engineering, um, driving a lot of uh, model-based system engineering and moving our engineering into more of the, the digital world. So it's interesting in how we're able to put systems and systems of systems in place in understanding manufacturing better because we're, we're building again, new factories and the way we're setting up our factories today are very different and designing them very different than how we've done them in the past to go after that. And the digital world has enabled us to, to do that a lot better and a lot faster. So that's, that's interesting, Ken, you know, uh... Moving from Motorola to the you know uh, the you know the Whirlpool business you know with the cutthroat margins, so let me fire the first one. Uh, so 
with your experience across the you know years in the product development and across the industries uh, the last two years have been very interesting for the engineering world with the covid and you know the latest geopolitical tensions the war and you know has a huge impact in terms of uh, components availability the manufacturing getting disrupted and uh, you know the the consumer demand going through the spikes and uh, and we have seen a you know adoption of digital in a big way you know to offset some of these disruptions so uh, you want to share any specific strategies that you have uh, picked on for the you know whirlpool very specific or relevant for the consumer industry uh, to yeah. work around perfect um so how i think about it and in, in the processes that we've put in place is um in today's environment you have to be extremely agile um you think you're coming to work with one plan and the moment you get in you find out and start reading your emails that what you thought you had in place is is not the plan of what you need to do so you're scrapping what you thought you were going to get done and move forward and so um the advancements of analytics and ability to be able to understand um current situation of what you have so from a, a manufacturing perspective um maybe you you just found out um where you have in many cases we have two way what we call two way schedule sharing so we put out schedules from a digital perspective to all the supply base they confirm back um this is what they're planning on shipping and then we also have uh, advanced notifications of what is coming in and so the analytics of that to be able to understand this is how we could run each of the plants and set up um the products that we need to be able to um deliver and build uh, for that day what we plan and tie that back to uh the the cut the consumer demand because what wound up happening in the appliance um industry is more people were working from home and we were anticipating at the start of the pandemic that potentially there might be a, a little bit of a downturn but we saw the exact opposite people started investing more in appliances because they were they were at home and so it, it created an immediate you know demand spike that we had to figure out how to recover to and so you know you mentioned you know semiconductor shortages and, and those types of things so um the digital aspects of our business um we're a, I'm a systems and systems of systems uh person and so if you're trying to figure out all right now I I can't get this component from a supplier um how do I then go and qualify a component um uh, from another supplier so our digital capabilities have enabled um that greatly and so we have digital mock up units and we're able to use our computer aided engineering our modeling and simulation capability to without ever getting actually physical product to be able to understand the parameters of a, another part from a a different supplier that potentially we could get and go th through um qualification in many cases without having to do physical testing and put things in place and so think about that you know the the old days of going through validation and verification aspects of you know testing everything to now working um in a in a pure digital way to understand exactly what's go what's going on and going through your CAE analysis and your your CAM modeling with digital mockup units and all those things so it enables us to move a lot faster um and because we've done a lot of the the pre-work to set up those models and the simulation capability that we've had to to deliver and so yeah it it's it's helped dramatically moving through that but um we continue to advance on all those fronts and and figure out how to do those things better so so uh, with all these challenges uh, can i you know the more you adapt at digital especially you know uh, in the manufacturing supply chain i think you 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 touched upon it that the actually demand peaked uh, in the early stages of the covid you know i know i think uh, a lot of companies have moved to especially the appliances companies moved to the third shift to and uh, you know work around uh, so we have seen that in you know uh, industries have adopted something like called supply chain control towers you know to track the you know the, the components at every stage multi tiers and this is something tech mahindra has done for various industries as well automotive and other so the years and which actually connects the you know uh, data from type 2 type 3 uh, suppliers and you know uh, all the way in terms of component visibility the production visibility mm -hmm. so that you tie it back into your uh, you know by your factory and uh, you know able to simulate how your production can be you know by next few weeks and a few months as well 
uh, you know, which calls for a you know, lot of uh, digitalization across your, uh, you know, not only your value chain, but also, you know, your supplier value chain and, you know, your partner's value chain. Do you want to share, you know, how, you know does uh, Whirlpool has gone through a similar journey? Where do you stand? And, you know, what kind of benefit, uh, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, the supply chain control towers uh, you know, kind of things would, uh, you know, uh, give it to, uh, you know, a company like, uh, you know, uh, Whirlpool? Your descriptions are very accurate of what many companies had to go through, understanding tier one, two, threes all the way down. And in some cases, what we've had to do is um, we took direct control over some of the tier twos and tier threes to understand exactly what the different contracts and making sure that we were we were going to get the supplies of what we needed. And so the control tower uh, philosophy and capabilities absolutely have to be there in, in every business. Um, again, I, I use the, the term from an engineering perspective down to the atomic level. Essentially, this is a different way. It's not atomic level, but you better understand in every discipline. It's no longer a superficial high level, you know, things are, are coming in. You're managing things down to infinite levels and, and it becomes then very difficult when you're dealing with a, a company like Whirlpool Corporation with over 50 sites all over the world and the different components that are coming in all over the world to, to different sites and understanding exactly what's going on. You can't do that um, with some of the older systems. You have to understand every aspect and especially with what was going on, you're so tight, you know, with, you know, supplies, you've got, you know, where is everything in that whole supply chain also and what's actually coming. And you've got things on boats that are components on boats that potentially are clogged at a port. We ran into a lot of that. And so understanding that supply chain, what port, diverting them to different ports, getting logistics to um, alternate logistics arrangements to be able to get parts to what was going on from a, a manufacturing production facility. And so, you're, you know, the, in the old days, you know, you heard terminology and manufacturing of just in time. Um, you know, a lot of what, you know, automotive and, and advanced companies are just in time, but also just in sequence with what you're, you're trying to build and things are coming in directly, you know, to a mail drop equivalent inside of, of manufacturing. And then those parts, you know, with our systems that we're looking at, that's where the ASNs, advanced shipping notices come to us to be able to say, hey, we know it's on the way, we know it's gonna be delivered. And, and what COVID and the pandemic did is there was multiple delays that even with some of those, you wound up getting extension. And so, the reaction to a lot of that was, I think for many corporations, we you started to build a little more of your incoming material to buffer a little more for what you saw for the disruptions and it's just natural. And so, you know, the digital systems allow you to come up with the right profiles or what are you seeing out there to be able to control those much, much tighter um, than what we've ever done before. And what I would say, you know, also whenever you're looking at those control towers and, and everything else that goes on, you know, we've also used the, the digital technology to help us design for the manufacturability and, and all the rest of that. And so um, with AI and, and VR, we're able to look at, you know, an, an operator on a line when we designed. So we just built a new plant um, in India, as an example, um, to set up each of those lines. Uh, we have essentially a, a complete 3D model with operators working on it. And you're able to then you know, work with the 20th percentile or 25th percentile to, you know, 100th percentile of the physical person being able to maneuver and ensuring that from an ergonomic perspective that, you know, the sequencing that you have set up in your processing of this is done correctly. So you're not going to have problems and that the entire material flow inside of, you know, the operations is done. And so right in the middle of all of this, we're building factories and, and, you know, increasing capacity to respond uh, and without those digital tools of making sure of the, the supply, how you've done all that logistics and everything else to ensure that we can continue to, to manufacture, it's extremely complicated. And unless you, you really have your hands around all this, you're gonna, you're gonna wind up with hiccups. And by the way, many companies did. And so that's where you saw the scheduled downtime and, and stuff like that that's going on. And, and again, my, I, I let in with Agile, um, what you thought your plan was coming into the day as a, a plant manager and sitting back and looking at it, probably not gonna be what you thought it was going to be. And, and now 
uh, again, you're, you're walking in and what you thought was going to happen for a delivery didn't wind up happening. And so now you're essentially just trying to rebalance, realign and figure out what you can get done and get it out. So we were fortunate in that situation during while that was all going on, whatever we could build, people were buying. Um, and so now you're seeing things equalize back again where, you know, your SNOP activities better be a lot more precise because now, you know, you're, you're back into the mode of uh, promotional activities, understanding what's happening and being able to build the right products at the right time. And so there's been a, a big shift of going back to, you know, trying to control the, the way things have been a little bit more of normalcy versus the appliance industry was if we could build it, people would buy it. It, it, it didn't matter. They were just looking for things. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a crazy, but uh, anyways, so they say necessity is, necessity is the mother of invention, but then I think, you know, the necessity has actually, you know, pushed the digital adoption in these days. But so one last question, uh, you know, can uh, you talked, uh, you know, you talked about how the MBSC and system of systems and have been adopted and it's a complete digital, you know, product development is uh, adopted in Whirlpool. We also see a trend of hyper personalization, you know, uh, coming in, and uh, this is another area where manufacturing operations, especially with you know, people wanting everything to be personalized to their taste, and uh, so uh, I think that the first build is something we hear for small appliances. But uh, what do you think uh, the landscape uh, for large appliances? Uh, you know, uh, looking at the availability of uh, data and availability of analytics, and uh, you know, the advanced technologies for hyper. For, uh, localization and hyper personalization of uh, and our consumer preferences to have specialization so uh, how do you see this uh, you know uh, evolving uh, in, in in from the view of you know Whirlpool's business yeah so um first of all you have to plan um your architectures from an engineering perspective to be able to do that and so the approach becomes um extremely modular and so um what the the core performance of any product needs to be able to do uh, what it what it needs to do, and so that needs to be set up as a module, and I can connect. And with today's advancements, even for parts, as an example, um, I could go with our um, additive manufacturing or, you know, 3D printing. The other word for it to to go out. I can print in in all kinds of different mediums, and so personalization in an appliance could be all right. I want knobs that look exactly like this that are designed especially for me. For whatever goes on and, and I want to be the only person in the world that has this and I want it made out of a, a certain material to be able to do that and so we have all those those capabilities uh, to be able to do that and actually um, for a lot of our rapid prototyping we're able to do that and so what you're seeing is companies like Whirlpool it was developed more for that in the earlier design but you're able to use those same tools for the hyper personalization for people who have a lot of money that want to spend you know, money on something that's just for them. Uh, we'll do just about anything they want to, to be able to do that. But the, the key part of that, why I started with uh, the modularity, the, the products always have to work with great precision and with the right qualities. And so what you try to do is, you know, a cavity for uh, cooking. It needs to be done with great precision, with the best quality in the world to be able to do that. What you touch, what you feel, all those things can be easily customized, customizable to be able to deliver with today's tools to be able to understand those. Um, and so, yeah, we're we're able to do that. We, In fact, we are doing that. We're running with very short run things. Um, and, and actually some of the materials are amazing, you know, exotic, we're, we're wrapping refrigerators with, you know, exotic leathers for what people want. Um, interiors for, you know, you, you sit down with a designer and say, this is what I want it to look like. And so um, it, it's, it's really cool coming down to be able to do that. Um, again, it, it costs a little bit of well, a little bit more money for someone who wants something like that. But businesses need to be able to adapt, and then they become sort of, um, you know, a, a really good advertising piece that's out there. That this is the very high end. This look at what's really possible, and then you know it, it also helps drive other sales um, from an organizational perspective. But yes, every company better be able to figure out how to how to do that and how to um, customize their product for whatever their, the consumer needs are. And, and again, I would extend it a little bit, you know, beyond the hyper personalization. Um, things are just changing so rapidly from an innovation perspective. Again, the modular approach, you have to understand where are those trends, where's technology going, and then how do you interject that capability with speed? Um, and so the, the days, you know, I, I could just sort of give you an idea of what we called our old leap 
platform, which was our top loader, biggest thing. It ran for 25 years. Our platforms now um, run for maybe two years. Pretty much. Maybe two, maybe three. <laughs> and so, you know, engineers that were working on that platform for, you know, 25 years, it was, I don't know, if you lived in the U.S., you saw the old Maytag repairman, and he was just yes. sitting around doing nothing. Well, okay, you know, th those days are over. And now every day you're, you're, you're now working on the, the next latest and greatest and personalizing things and upgrading technologies changing, you know, just about everything that you could think of is, is really moving very rapidly. And it's actually, I think a lot more fun. Great, great. No, great to hear this, uh, you know, Ken, and uh, I think it's a short talk, but uh, you touched upon how the, you know, digital ecosystem from the digital thread, the MBSC system of systems and how the new factories are being built you know, to enable leverage this the digital, uh, you know, uh, the uh, product or digital value chain and, uh, you know, catering to the changing needs of consumers, right? You know, the factories needs to, the lines, short lines and the assembly lines need to be changed, you know, very, very informative and very uh, interesting to see where Whirlpool is going with it. And uh, I'm sure, you know, the that data-driven manufacturing would uh, definitely drive the efficiency and customer satisfaction. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, you know, very much for taking time out today and uh, sharing your thoughts and, you know, your experiences. Uh, I know, you know, it's a very uh, busy uh, uh, period for you, but uh, again, you know, uh, uh, thanks once again and have a good day. Thank you, uh, Ken and Jaya, for that wonderfully stitched uh, conversation. Mm -hmm.